Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I can just see people still streaming in, um, but we will make a start as we're just after two o'clock. So a very warm welcome to session three of the NHS Forest Conference 2023. Um, very warm welcome back to anyone who's been with us for the first two se sessions this morning. Um, and welcome to anyone who's just joining us um, for this afternoon's session. So we're about to go into session three, um, which is all about using the NHS Green Estate for health and well-being. Um, before we dive into that, I'm just going to very quickly go over the housekeeping again, just for any new people who have just joined. Um, and as a quick reminder for everyone else, uh, so all of our presentations will be recorded and made available on our website after the conference is finished. Um, so you'll be able to go back and have a look at any recordings. Um, everyone's cameras and microphones are switched off uh, as this is a webinar format. Um, but we would love for you to engage uh, with each other and with the, part uh, with the panelists as well. So please do make use of the chat box um, and also the Q&A box as well. Um, just to briefly explain those things. So if you go to the chat box, make sure um, if you're wanting to uh, send a message to everyone, make sure the little button above the chat box says everyone um, and you can uh, ask questions or start discussion, maybe talk a bit about uh, who you are and uh, why you've joined us today. Uh, but if you have any specific questions for the panellists, then do use the Q&A box um, and our chair for the session will be monitoring that Q&A uh, uh, section um, and, and asking the panellists questions during the Q&A section. You can thumbs up other people's questions. So if there are any questions that you particularly like the sound of, make sure you thumbs that up um, and it will help Helen to kind of manage, uh, manage those questions. If you'd like to see uh, subtitles, uh, you can turn on closed captions by clicking the CC show captions button, as you can see it on the screen there, um, and that will automatically generate sub subtitles uh, so that you can follow along that way. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to our chair for the next session, Helen Townsend. Over to you, Helen. Thanks, Sarah. Um, welcome, everybody. Welcome back. Um, I hope you had a good session this morning. Um, one of the things I did want to, 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 to talk about now was that um, we've done the place shaping. We've learned about how to plant the trees. Um, we've got the go ahead. We have made these places or we have these places at our disposal. This session is going to talk about how we make the most of those places, how we engage and facilitate our audiences, be them um, uh, volunteers or be them um, participants, um, clients, um, whatever you, any way you want to call them. But we're all about the people in this session. We've done the place shaping. So just to let you know who I am, I'm um, the Forestry Commission Policy Lead for People, Landscape and Historic Environment, which is all about people. So hence why I think I've been asked to chair this session. Um, I've been involved with the NHS Forest since conception. Um, I know I don't look that old, but I have been around, around for a while. Um, and Forestry Commission has been very supportive of NHS Forest. And I think one of the beauties of NHS Forest, um, which is what we'll explore in a bit, is it isn't just about place shaping. It is about the people agenda. Um, and it is about now engaging people, using people to bring people to the spaces that we've created, to the trees that we've planted. So that's what this session is going to be about. So I'll, I'll lead into our kind of first speaker. Our first speaker is um, Gordon Malcolm. He works for Dementia Adventure. Gordon has had a very background for, in education, education graduate, and um, has been working in the field for a long time. He's passionate about training and skills acquisition. And I think his presentation will really focus on why we need knowledge exchange and why we need to build our skills in this area. So over to you, Gordon. Thank you very much. I'm just gonna share my presentation with you. There we go. So I'm here today to talk to you about a project funded by the Trees Call to Action Fund involving creating two new and exciting training courses for the NHS estates around thinking about inclusion, re-enablement and discharge. But first, 
let me tell you a little bit more about Dementia Adventure and what we do and why we have been chosen to deliver this project. So dementia Advent at Dementia Adventure, we think differently about dementia. We believe that with the right support, everybody living with dementia can get outdoors, experience the well-being benefits of connecting with nature and enjoying a more active and fulfilled life. We do that through the creation of supported holidays and that we run for people living with dementia and somebody they know well, so their husband, wife, son, daughter or a loved one. We also provide training, free training for family and friends, but we also do tr professionals training and work with a range of organisations to enable them to become more dementia accessible. We're the only charity solely focusing on dementia and nature, and Dementia Adventure is the sector leader in, in working with organisations, whether that be blue, green spaces, health or care sector organisations. And why do we do that? because there are currently over 900,000 people living with dementia in the UK, and this number is likely to rise to over 1.6 million by 2040. So at Dementia Adventure, we have a great track record of working with a range of professionals. And in our 14 years history as a charity, we work with 17, over 17,000 professionals, providing tailor-made training packages for a whole variety of organizations, such as in the medical and medical and care professionals, green and blue spaces, as I said before, but also local authorities and charities. We've recently had a the privilege of working with the National Trust by providing training and support to enable them to run a trial new service, a dementia support service within one of its property settings. And we were then also commissioned to evaluate this two year pilot and then to create a toolkit. So the learning from that pilot can be rolled out in five other premises uh, across the trust. We also participate in research, so everything that we do is grounded in the latest research about supporting people in with dementia, and we're currently in a research project at the moment with Southampton University and Social Farms and Gardens. We train healthcare professionals for providing Essex and have worked with a range of care providers and care home organisations, including Abbey Fields and MHA. So I know we're a dementia charity, and so you might be thinking, well, is the work and is the training applicable to me? Because, but we're going to say yes, because whilst we work and we support people living with dementia, as Wendy Mitchell says here on this quote on the screen, when you get it right for people living with dementia, you get it right for so many other groups of people. Why is that? Well, it's because people living with dementia struggle with a range of medical conditions. And so those conditions are shared by many other of the clients that you will be working with. So we actually say that yes, our training is applicable for people with other medical conditions too, because dementia covers cognitive uh, impairment, sensory sensitivity, sensory impairment, mental health difficulties, and communication difficulties. Now, Wendy Mitchell is used to work for the NHS. She's now an ambassador and a passionate advocate for promoting living well with dementia. And so it's really key that if you attend the training that we're running, it will be of benefit to other client groups as well. So why is connecting with woods and woodland so important? Well, actually there's been a wealth of research about the uh, physiological impact that it has on changing the brain's chemistry. So Miles Richardson is a professor in uh, at the University of Derby. He wrote a book, Reconnection, Fixing Our Broken Relationship with Nature. And he cites a range of research that's been undertaken to look at how the connection with woods and woodlands highly impacts our physiological body. So what did it do? Well, it he also talked about, uh, there's a piece of research that was undertaken in Japan where people were blindfolded, given exposure, and asked to touch with the palms of their hand different materials such as bark, tiles, stainless steel, and untreated oak, just for 90 seconds. And they measured the brain activity 
and the changes that occurred. And it was quite amazing that just within those 90 seconds, that actually by touching wood, and we're talking a natural piece of oak, it had a calming effect, a relaxation effect, and it, it, it evoked feelings of contentment in those participants in that research. So it's absolutely key that connecting with nature has a range of positive impacts on all of us. So at this point, we're going to hear from a gentleman called Chris. He's living with dementia and his, he's with his wife, Jane, because at Dementia Adventure, when we produce training, it always has the lived experiences of people and how what is important to them and how things make them feel. So let's hear from Chris. He was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and mixed dementia in his mid 50s. And he's going to discuss and explain to us how his connection with nature, how important that is to him. I, I sometimes go out in the... Oh, sorry, a slight technical hitch. ...the garden to sit down and have a few tears on my own. Um, I'm not going to get disturbed. I'm not going to be embarrassed. And it's something I do now and again. And the other day I was doing it, I don't use it today, maybe the other week, and a hedgehog came out. And immediately I was distracted from my anxiety, my stress, my depression. I didn't have dementia. I didn't have any problems at all. And that's what nature does for you. It distracts you. It's beautiful. It doesn't ask anything of you. It just displays itself and, and is there for our appreciation. He was just in the moment, just him and this hedgehog just walking past. Just, was it two feet? Just two feet away from him? Yeah, yeah. And it just got on with its life. And I just sat there and I watched him going backwards and forwards and even the cat come across. Mm. And the cat was watching it as well. It's obviously had dealings with the hedgehog because he didn't go for it. But even the cat was watching as well. And, 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 and I now go out and I look for these things now. And it, it's beautiful. It, it's, there is no, uh, you don't fail. You don't succeed. You just observe. And there's no... There's no um, um, pressure. pressure. There's no pressure. The, 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 it's just there for you to appreciate and distract you. And you are normal again. You know, you're not that person with, with dementia. You don't have any problems at all. And I think that goes for any, anyone and everyone. So I think you'll agree that Chris summarises beautifully how important when living with dementia, that connection with nature is feeling normal again, because actually living with dementia is exhausting. And to be outdoors in nature and having nature based experiences is incredibly soothing. So research undertaken by Dementia Adventure and Natural England identified there are a range of health and well-being benefits. We know getting outdoors is good for everyone, but this was specifically involving people living with dementia. On the right hand side, you can see that it improves, it reduces, um, as Chris described, depression, stress and anxiety. But also it actually connects to our emotional memories because we have in our brain a part of the brain called the amygdala where we store emotional memories and that's less affected by dementia. And just as the way that you may have seen on programmes on the television about music connecting with people's brain and dementia, well nature and nature experiences connect to those memorable experiences in our amygdala. So it helps with our attention, it helps with stimulating memory and reminiscency. It also stimulates our verbal expression. But the, there are other health and well-being benefits supporting improvements in appetite, sleeping, a sense of belonging and our general well-being. And you might think, how long do you have to be outdoors in nature to receive these health and well-being benefits? Well, actually, it's only a small amount of time, just 10 minutes. So it's not about a giant adventure. Small exposure can make a real difference. So we did a research program with a care chain and actually they called it their Breath of Fresh Air program. And the impact on its residents was quite ph phenomenal. So the improvements to residents, moderate loneliness went down from 77% to 11% after undertaking nature-based experiences. Time outside decreased falls by 10% in the home. 
Those getting seven or more hours of sleep increase from 55 to 88%. Residents who rated their appetite as good rose from 66 to 100%. And 33% of residents who said their mood was good before the program, that rose to 66% after. So as you can see, the impact of our training and nature-based experience is profound because we also get benefits from connecting with things like the soil. This connection with the soil, there's research that identifies that it also releases serotonin. Serotonin in our brain is our happy hormone. It helps to make us feel good because there are natural bacteria in the soil which actually stimulate the release of serotonin. So it's like the release of a natural antidepressant. It also strengthens our immune system and also it provides us with that general sense of well-being. So the nature experiences that we'll be looking at in our programs will not only be with contacting with nature, but actually getting in touch with it, touching the soil too, with growing activities, if that's appropriate to you in your setting. At Dementia Adventure, we also know that dementia can affect the senses so that we ensure that our programs and our uh, nature experience are multi-sensory. Now, getting outdoors in nature is naturally multi-sensory because as soon as you're stepping outside, you're involving increased coordination, your vision, your hearing is being stimulated, smell, motor control, and also your taste if we're going foraging, um, but also your bodily awareness. So research has identified that people who keep their brain active, then they can slow the progression of the disease of dementia. So by going outdoors and having nature, nature experiences, that naturally is a multi-sensory experience that stimulates all these parts of the brain. It also stimulates language because when these parts of the brains are firing, our communication is also supported. So, in the NHS, over 40% of older people in hospital are living with dementia. This research was undertaken by three health partnerships across the country, in North London, in Birmingham and Solihull, and in West Yorkshire. It identified that the length of stay is twice that of people without dementia. That a, call, a third sorry, of the patients do not need to be in hospital, and they account for a quarter of the delayed discharges. 10% of all readmissions within NHS properties were within 30 days. So people in the dementia accounted for 10% readmissions. But also people who were admitted from home, they found that the longer the people stay in hospital, the worse it affects their dementia symptoms and their physical health. And patients also are twice as likely to fall in hospital, an event which then will quadruple their length of stay. So that's why at Dementia Adventure, we have created this innovative training that we hope you will join. The training is designed to get, help you gain awareness of the benefits of the nature and being outdoors, to learn about the practical steps of planning outdoor experiences and improving your understanding of making things multisensory. You're going to learn practical ways to connect and engage with the person living with dementia. But also, most importantly, you're going to get a range of tools, templates, lots of resources that are going to support you in organising and running your own experiences. Because at Dementia Adventure, we don't just want to give you the theory and give you the science and the research behind it. We want to give you free tools, templates and things that you can use to practically start activities and running accessible opportunities in your particular settings. So the sessions are split up into two. So session one is going to focus on sensory connection and nature experiences. And that's planned for Tuesday, the 29th of March. And it's a three hour session. And that's going to be looking at not only the research behind why connecting with nature is so, so important, but also all of the types of activities you might want to look at running, but also looking at how to positively risk manage when you're working with people living with dementia. Session two is nature experiences, taking those next steps. We'd like you to come back to talk about what you've been trying, but then to look at sharing that experience, but also exploring the barriers and looking at other resources. So that training is available now on Eventbrite, and hopefully the link is going to be put in the chat function so you can actually click on the link and actually book yourself a place. It costs £15 and the, 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 the money will go to natural uh, uh, the NHS Forest Fund.
If you need any more information from me, please get in contact. It's gordon at dementiaadventure.co.uk or look at our website at dementiaadventure.org. Thank you very much. That was super, Gordon. Thank you. Um, and what's kind of moving is some of the, I know they told me not to get distracted by the chat, but I do get distracted by the chat. There's some lovely kind of firsthand personal experiences um, that have been shared. So it, it feels that it's kind of, you know, everybody knows this, everybody's experienced this, but, you know, when we've got the offer of that kind of training um, opportunity, I think everybody should make the most of that. So thank you very much for that. So um, don't forget to put your questions, um, if you have any, to Gordon in the Q&A, and we'll come back to those in the panel session in a little bit. But I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is Ben Whitaker. Um, ben is an um, occupational therapist by training and has um, various accolades to his name um, in terms of um, working with a wide variety of organisations. But this one I was particularly um, impressed with, Ben. It says you were the initial project lead for the World Federation of Occupational Therapists Sustainability Working Group. And you became one of the first chief sustainable, sustainability officers clinical fellows at Greener NHS working with the office of the, and that's a bit, I don't understand the acronym. Perhaps you can tell me a bit more about that. But the one thing Ben did want let, to me to let you know about was that he's a very keen ukulele player. So he's a real person with a real passion um, for ukulele. So um, I'm gonna um, hand over to Ben now to talk about the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare's initiative um, about green walking. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, Yes, I'm Ben Whitaker from Centre for Sustainable Healthcare, and I'm the um, Sustainable Healthcare Delivery Lead, and the acronym is AHP Lead, which is Allied Health Professions. My background is a mental health occupational therapist, one of the 14 allied health professions. And today I'm going to be talking about um, CSH's Green Walking in Mental Health Recovery Initiative. So I will... Share my screen. So um, there is a QR code in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, which will take you through to our new green walking web pages and link through to our green walking guide, which I'll be speaking about in more depth. So the Green Walking Mental Health Recovery Initiative and the guide focus on developing green walking groups for psychiatric inpatients. And this is a photo from the back cover of the Green Walking Guide. There are many issues with being on a psychiatric ward, uh, being an inpatient, including having reduced access to therapeutic activities, having limited opportunities to support physical health and activity, there being sometimes unconsidered and excessive use of the Mental Health Act, which can lead to excessive detention and lack of supported leave. And for inpatients, often green space access can be overlooked or can be one of the first things that falls off the list if there's uh, short staffing. Despite its value, like we've heard a lot today, a lot of great talks about the value of accessing green spaces, um, supporting mental health, wellbeing and recovery. And also people can have difficulties with the transition between inpatient and community service when they're discharged. Green walking groups can address some of the issues in each of these problem areas. But simply green walking is about moving through a natural space. And green walking groups can provide respite and healing to people receiving inpatient psychiatric care through walking together in nature. These walks are easy to establish, they're safe, they're cheap, and they build on the very significant existing body of evidence we've had a lot about today that has established the health and well-being benefits of accessing green spaces and walking. This goes back to an age-old knowledge about green spaces being integral to mental health, well-being and recovery. And as we've moved towards more of a medicalised approach to dealing with mental health issues, it feels that some of that age-old knowledge has been lost. So we, we want to bring together the best of the current medical approach and reintegrate green spaces um, as a core part of mental health, well-being and recovery. 
So another need in mental health services is the shift towards sustainable and holistic models of care. And in order to have sustainable health care, we need to have the triple win of protecting the planet, improving health and saving money. These are also referred to as the triple bottom line of meeting the environmental agenda, the social agenda and the economic agenda. And these quotes all come from the Green Walking Guide, show how the Green Walking Initiative meets all three of these things. And it's, it's worth noting that the social benefits aren't just for service users, staff also have a great benefit from Green Walking. And it's, it's also felt on the ward that the benefit that the people who go out on the walk have, they then bring that back to the ward and then there's a ripple out effect with the benefit of the walking group to other people on the ward who didn't even go on the walk. So the most important principle of sustainable clinical practice is preventative healthcare. And this is included um, in the financial elements at the bottom here. Uh, when we're talking about green walking contributing to patients' recovery and potentially preventing future mental health issues. But this also, if we can prevent ongoing mental health issues, it obviously has social benefits and environmental benefits as well in terms of reduction of carbon, of um, ongoing health interventions. Central Sustainable Healthcare set up Green Walking in 2018 with funding from the Network for Social Change. Uh, teams were recruited across these eight NHS mental health trusts, each to run a pilot scheme of new Green Walking groups. A psychi psychiatrist, Jacob Krishnovsky, led the Green Walking initiative then. And there are a wealth of benefits from these groups. Um, which became apparent very quickly. I'm going to be talking a bit more about what happened in Kent, but just from their one pilot group on one ward, it then spread very quickly across four wards with all four wards at the Medway Hospital having uh, green walking groups. So these wealth of benefits and first hand knowledge from the Green Beacon sites informed the writing of this guide, Green Walking and Mental Health Recovery. And when this was published in its launch in May 2020. It was endorsed by the Royal College of Psychiatrists, the Royal College of Occupational Therapists, and the Royal College of Nursing. Uh, there's a QR code again in the, in the bottom of the uh, bottom right hand of the screen. Um, or if you um, search for CSH and Green Walking, you will come to the web pages about this where the guide is freely downloadable. This is an overview of the contents in the Green Walking Guide. And yeah, we've heard a lot about the evidence today, um, about why this is important. There was a lot of learning from the Green Beacon sites, which then informed the guidelines on how to set up a walk. And there are quotes throughout the guide and I will let you have a look at some of these. And we'll say the, the third quote down um, was from Adrian James, who at the time of the guide was launched was the president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And there was a piece in the I newspaper about the Green Walking Guide where he was interviewed and said he would like to see this rolled out across all psychiatric inpatient settings across the UK. So Julie Delahaye um, on the left here, I think that's Eddie's another OT um, in the picture too. Uh, they, as I said, um, they green walking rolled out across um, all wards in the hospital very quickly. And they had a photographer come and take some photos from their group, which I'm gonna play now. I think over Zoom, this might be a little bit jolty, but... Um, going to show you some lovely photos from their walk in Medway now.
Lovely moment of calm, and I appreciate that moment of calm, seeing those photos, and to actually be able to leave a ward environment, which can be very intense, and experience that can be very profound. And the this is a slide from a presentation Julie did about this, and these are some of her notes in that Quoting Julie, we didn't only choose informal patients, but saw an opportunity to take positive risk with patients detained under the Mental Health Act. And beside the usual benefits, where you would expect increase in stammer and confidence and opportunity for conversation and peer support, Julie said, nature has its own power of healing. When you enter the woods, you stop and are transfixed by its beauty. The chatter in your head stops tension falls from the shoulders and the breath takes a more relaxed pace. The person behind the illness is revealed. We see the patient as a person and they say uh, see us as people too. It's because we spend more time with them in a different environment. We just enable them, but they become the best that they can be. And Green walking groups have now spread out across Kent and Medway um, for their other hospitals as well. And there's a lot of good work Julie's done. Julie um, comes to a uh, peer support networking group that I'll have details for at the end. So if anybody is interested in finding out more about this, we have a group tomorrow lunchtime. After the Green Walking Guide came out, it wasn't just um, people who had been walking groups before, but then expanded this across the hospital. This is um, from Claire Mitchie, um, who's the lead OT at Millview Hospital, so it's a partnership NHS Foundation Trust. And after reading the Green Walking um, Guide, Claire looked to adapt their out and about groups so that Green Walking became a standalone intervention. And they developed group protocol to specify goals and format and set a standard that all wards at Millview would facilitate a weekly green walking group. They developed leaflets such as this with maps and information of local green walking routes. And they also made improvements to their ward-based green spaces and gardens so that patients, inpatients who were unable to leave the ward could still access green spaces, could still be close to trees, and could still get the benefits. And again, lots of positive feedback from people who were just able to be out and be in these spaces and had lots of um, health benefits for them. The, the last example I'm going to give you is from St Anne's Hospital um, in Barnet, Enfield and Haringey Mental Health Trust. And this hospital has an, a really old woodland site where there are many rare and exotic trees found across the whole of the hospital site, some nearly a hundred years old. And the, the Friends of St Anne's Green Spaces, or STAGS, is a group that was launched during Mental Health Awareness Week in 2021, and it helps to care for the green spaces at St Anne's. They are looking to conserve and enhance the green spaces into the future through long-term whole site management. So Camilla Cox, who can be seen planting trees um, in the bottom left here, she is the OT and therapy lead. They got 20 trees from an HS forest and planted them in different locations across the site, some in and around the ancient woodlands, some um, others in more open areas where they hope to develop more gardening activity. And the day created enthusiasm for more gardening activities on the hospital site and she said it was part of a growing interest in the green spaces that they have available to them at the hospital. So from this we can see there, there's a great variety in the ways that we can access um, trees, woodland, green spaces, but the more that we can make the most of growing the NHS forest or mental health sites, the more green walking opportunities there will be for people and the more it will help support their mental health, recovery and well-being.
So if you're not aware at the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare, we have um, 33 specialty and discipline specific networks, including Green Space for Health, and the Mental Health Sustainability Network, which hosts um, our monthly green walking networking group. And we have the AHP, Allied Health Professional Sustainability Network, and we have a networking event with them tonight. There are lots of networking events with the networks. So if you might be interested in that tonight, do please have a look on the network. All the networks are free. There's no paywalls. All the resources are on there are free to access and um, lots of great resources and information on there. And you can link up with other people. And if you are interested in coming along to our group tomorrow, there is a QR code there. Um, or you can find tickets for this event for free on Ticket Taylor. So this is peer support for anybody wanting to start a green walking group or wanting to expand their green walking group. And on our website, we do have guidance for individuals who would like to use the green walking guide for organizations, hospitals um, that might like green walking across um, their site and for NHS trusts or ICSs who might like to expand green walking across the whole trust, which Sussex Partnership are exploring. And there are ways that we can support you with that at Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. So if you're interested in that, do please get in touch. This is my one of my favourite green walks, um, Castle Hall Nature Reserve, just above Brighton. I try and get there most days, but my um, email's just at the bottom there. And as we heard in our keynote this morning, we, we all need our green spaces for our mental health. And this one's mine. Thank you. Again, super stuff, Ben. Incredibly inspiring. Um, I, what I do love is this, this again, this, I know I'm being distracted by it, but the chat, people are answering questions from other people in terms of evidence and experience and I you know I keep asking this question about how people are getting their information and how they're networking so really good plug there for the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare uh, networks that will provide that support to people and allow people to network and share good ideas and learn from each other. Um, quite ironic really that the 2020 which publication date when we all kind of really, really understood the benefits of for mental health um, from lockdown of getting outside and walking. So um, I think the time is it's good timing and the time is right at the moment to kind of really try and embed these things, because I think people for the first time really understand what it is when you don't have those things or aren't able to access green space. So thank you very much for that. Our next speaker is the, um, I'm going to call her the Queen of Hearts. Um, Carol Longdon um, is a, um, the founder and facilitator of the Forest of Hearts uh, project. What a great name. So hence why I'm kind of going to refer to her as the Queen of Hearts. Um, Carol says she's a good jack of all trades, but she's obviously a very passionate individual that has worked in Warwickshire and has a really good experience of working on um, practical projects to improve kind of health and well-being. So over to you, Carol. Thanks, Helen. I like the Queen of Hearts. That's good. <laughs> I'll use that. Hi, everybody. Um, I will share my screen now, hopefully. <clears throat> yeah, is that good? OK, so... Um, as Helen said, I'm the founder of Forest of Hearts. Um, we're a tiny little charity near Stratford-upon-Avon, uh, and I set it up in 2015 after my brother died um, of mesothelioma. Uh, and as he was dying, it just seemed to both of us the importance of being outside in fresh air. Uh, and so I was lucky enough to be able to uh, set this up uh, after that sad uh, occurrence. Um, I'm a bit of a tree hugger from Oldham. Uh, <laughs> there aren't that many trees in Oldham. There used to be 17 mill chimneys when I looked out of my bedroom window. Uh, and so clearly the value of trees and green space has been said hundreds of times before. Um, right, so we, um, we, <laughs> 
I was at a conference at um, Stratford Hospital um, in the room where the lights are on there. Uh, and I thought, my goodness, you know, that patch of lawn there, that needs a garden. Um, and I spoke to um, uh, Emma, who was the head of the wellbeing centre there, and said, you know, could we put a garden there? And she said, yeah, but we're going to build a car park in uh, five years' time. Um, so it's only going to be temporary. <laughs> well, we'll have that, so that's okay. Uh, so we looked at what we could do, uh, and then we thought, well, if we're going to do that, then it would be helpful to have some people benefit from it. And um, we set up um, a little social prescribing project, um, which had these objectives. So we were really clear about what we wanted to do with this um, patch of lawn. Um, and essentially, we then went about um, recruiting um, people to join our green therapy group. Um, and we didn't have any money. Um, so, so we had to get some uh, corporate sponsorship. And we thought, oh, we'll go to RHS Malvern and see if uh, they'll give us a garden uh, as a show garden, uh, which was absolutely brilliant because they did. Uh, so that was the focal point for our volunteers to say, OK, we're going to put on a show garden. Um, what's involved and just the process of doing that was uh, fantastic everybody enjoyed it uh got to meet monty my heroes that was an added bonus uh the other added bonus was uh, we met bam from uh phil from bam construction uh bam like we work with a lot of corporate volunteers and a lot of corporate companies are very keen to help do things that give back to the environment and also particularly if it's linked to any kind of health benefits and mental health benefits. Uh, and so Phil um, got his team of apprentices. Uh, so it was their first two weeks on the job and there were about, I think about six of them. And their first job was to construct 12 raised beds. Um, and that's what they did. And then they helped us recruit some corporate teams to pay to come and plant. Um, so we did a team event and uh, got the whole thing planted in a day. So that was a, uh, another bonus. Uh, and so we now have an edible garden and the garden um, is used for uh, growing uh, veg for the uh, hospital wellbeing cafe. Uh, and unbeknownst to us, <laughs> Uh, the um, raised beds are two metres apart, so during lockdown it's absolutely brilliant and that those uh, seats that are at the moment people are standing in them, that they are actually seats now, um, uh, were a place where staff uh, came out and uh, enjoyed their lunch. Um, so the edible garden was kind of the start of it at Stratford-upon-Avon Hospital um, and We've used a model of um, fruit tree guilds, which um, none of us were gardeners at the start of this. I don't know if we are now, but we know a bit more than we did at the start. Um, so we use a, a, a concept of fruit tree guilds, which um, in those small beds, those beds are two and a half metres by one metre. Uh, we have um, a fruit tree. Uh, what we learned about that was putting it on the... Uh, uh, rootstock that doesn't grow very big so we've got some that need to come out because the rootstock's too big um, and then under planting that with in in this case Rosa Rigosa which has um, delicious um, rose hips that you can eat um, climbing nasturtium so you can um, eat those as well wild garlic uh, and so on so the fruit tree guild concept is one that we've carried on now. So we've done other gardens at um, Warwick Hospital and Leamington Rehab Hospital. Uh, and, and it's a nice concept because you kind of get an instant garden look um, in a small space in a short space of time. Um, so we... Um, we also look at companion planting so that um, the uh, each of the plants supports the plant nearest to it or next to it so that um, we, <laughs> we're trying to um, reduce the amount of weeding that it takes, the amount of watering that it takes, 
um, so that the gardens are, are fairly hardy and robust, um, even in uh, you know uh, the um, dry weather that we had last year. Um, so learning about the planting has been good, and and the we now have a, a process for creating green spaces, um, which starts with what what do the staff want basically. Um, and then looking at well, where where can we get funding? So we've we've been we haven't had any NHS funding, um, but we're pretty good at being able to um, draw in funds from um, other organisations and grants and so on, um, which can kickstart uh, some activity. I mean, I'm not going to the politics of it. We should be funding this stuff, but there you go. Um, so that's kind of the process that we use. Um, and we always start with a design. So um, by asking people what they want and knowing whether it's going to be a secluded place for people to come and sit and have their lunch. Um, is it for the staff? Is it for the patients? Is it for the visitors? Is it for everybody? Um, and then looking at maximizing um, the space that's available. Um, we're looking at Stratford. Um, there is a patch of land at the back of the car park. Um, and on the left-hand side of this design, you'll see we've put up a polytunnel, um, or rather a, um, <laughs> a company that um, grows salad veg, put up a polytunnel for us in, in two days, which was marvellous. Um, so that now is used as a, a space for um, groups that come to it. Um, we the reason that we're doing these spaces is partly to build biodiversity but also to boost mental health and well-being uh, and we have a green therapy group um, that meets on a tuesday and a friday and um it's a group made up of we probably have about a dozen regular people um some young people with uh, learning difficulties people with mental health difficulties people are referred from the iaps um uh, centre next door um, and also people that just want to come and give back you know um, just to get out of the house um, so the weekly therapy sessions are a couple of hours long and we use a grow coaching we've trained our facilitators and and four of the people that came to us um, as um, people wanting support uh, now facilitate and one of them is uh, full-time employed. Um, and we use a model of grow coaching, which is um, working with people to establish what their goals are. What, why do they want to be with us? What do they want to get from being in the open air and garden and so on? What do they are for reality is um, so that we can establish some kind of measure um, of success so that we know, you know, in three months time, if, the reality is they haven't been out of the house for two years in some cases. You know, if they come regularly, then that is a massive great achievement. Um, o for options. We look at what we can possibly do and we we act as signposters to other organisations, um, Citizens Advice, DWP and so on, uh, and, and W the will. So we, we, we kind of engage people in, in determining what they will do about it with our, our support. Um, so that's um, the weekly sessions. Um, the, the the weekly sessions clearly as well maintain the gardens. So um, here's some of the guys uh, laying out a veg bed, looking very pleased with themselves. Uh, and we've had loads of stuff grown this year. Um, John in the middle there, he's been helping us because uh, we didn't know much about veg growing, but we know a bit more now. Um, we are working with uh, Marianne Evans. These are four people um, that have joined the group. So we run a group for recently bereaved um, people at the hospice. Uh, and, and we're working on this concept of um, salutogenesis, which is um, helping people to look at what creates health. Uh, and we have a program of activities um, throughout the year. Uh, and they're in front of one of um, our grid gardens. So they were absolutely <laughs> delighted in that um, the grid garden grew um, from a, um, a one square metre. Um, they grew 
uh, beans and um, courgettes by the dozen, peas, you name it, in one square metre. Uh, so we've learned to uh, deliver quite a lot of veg in a small space of um, small space. Um, James was one of our first um, volunteers. He's now, <laughs> he's now run, um, I think it's uh, two half marathons, uh, and he just hadn't been out of the house at all um, until he, he came to us. Um, so he purposely, his goal was to um, get fit again, uh, and that's what he's done. But the thing for James as well was uh, giving back to the community. Um, so Mark now is our handyman. Um, again, he, he lost his confidence, left the army. Um, a carpenter, you see people tell us what their skills are and boy, do we take advantage in a good way. Um, so yeah, Mark, he does lots of um, our carpentry work, which is uh, we find in, uh, needed in the garden. Uh, and then John here, uh, he lost his wife last year. Um, he was really sceptical about coming apparently um, to the hospice, but now he loves it. Uh, and for him, it's kind of uh, clearing his mind. And the grid garden. Uh, and the grid garden is in a little box. You've got these seeds and we do a planting by numbers um, activity. Uh, and uh, the photograph that you saw uh, before was um, one of the uh, grid garden square meters. Um, we couldn't do what we do without working in partnership with um, the South Warwickshire NHS Foundation Trust. Um, and Karen, um, I guess, sums up why it works for the Trust. And it's interesting because as we're watering um, the garden, we put up some living walls by the car park. And the number of people that um, you know comment on how beautiful they are, and it gets everybody talking to each other, which is what gardening does. Um, funding, um, yeah, I mean, we've kind of uh, uh, been lucky to be awarded grants, but very lucky to be work working with um, corporates. Um, people. Uh, so if you're going to do it again, um, oh, sorry, I've got my alarm on here. Um, I would say be clear about the purpose, pick the right place, um, know who you're going to work with. Um, paying people has been a struggle, but we're doing it now. And and we we, we go out to play, we enjoy it. Um, and finally, uh, these are the little um, birds that were owlets that were born in our uh, barn owl box in our five acre nature reserve which we're now uh, pursuing so thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to you thank you very much thank you carol um you described it as a small project but boy is it mighty in terms of impact that was um that was lovely thank you um i have learned a new word there actually i haven't heard of um salutogenesis mm -hmm. before so that's an interesting a new one for me um again there's lots of um good contacts and good examples in the chat of other people that have worked on similar projects um and we've got some questions coming in the q a so we'll be going back to those in the panel session so um, moving on, we're going to move on to um, Tim Braun now from Forestry England. Uh, Forestry England is the uh, part of Forestry Commission that manages the nation's forests, the public forest estate. And um, now we've been working on health and wellbeing projects for a long time in the early days when I first joined the Commission. Um, but we've been more successful recently in terms of getting kind of bigger funding programmes. Um, and that's enabled us to employ people like Tim. And Tim is an expert in his own right. Um, he, he lives by, um, by what he talks. He's a cyclist, I hear, a hockey player, um, and surfs when it's warm, not when it's cold. Um, Tim has also worked in a variety of organisations. He's from a kind of ecological background, environmental background, and worked with national parks. Um, had some time on sand dunes. That'll be an interesting one to discuss. 
another time. Um, but more, but more recently has um, come into lead the active forest program in Forestry England. So um, moving away from the NHS estate now, but still looking at kind of health and um, wellbeing outreach projects. Over to you, Tim. Uh, thank, thank you, Helen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'll just share my screen. Good afternoon. I'm just going to, to talk through the Feel Good in the Forest uh, pilot project that was part of the active forest program that uh, was launched in 2014. Um, and Forestry England is the largest landowner in the country. We've got 1,500 sites. Um, we quite often tend to think about a destination site, but there's a lot more potential um, for getting people involved in the forest estate. Um, so what we wanted to do was look at the opportunities that we had across the nation's forests and identify ways that we could reduce the barriers to participation to help people get into the forest for health and well-being benefits, um, engaging with inactive and fairly active people as defined by the chief medical officer, so people that are doing less than 150 minutes of, of activity a week, um, programmes that would deliver health and well-being outcomes for the participants, and at the time it was when social prescribing was becoming more prevalent and better understood, how could we as an organisation better align our services and our policies to work alongside and maximise those potential partnerships. Now the models that we looked at uh, range for, uh, across a number of sites and the two feel good in the forest sites were uh, at Thames Chase that's down on the northeast London, southeast Essex border and at Chopwell Woods in Gateshead uh, near Newcastle. And Thames Chase uh, is a site that has 11 individual sites. So what we were doing there was looking at working and coordinating a variety of activity providers on our sites, because we had the asset, we had the amazing spaces, but there were then people who had skills in delivering activities. And then we know that there's this huge uh, potential community of individuals, organizations that would benefit from being active outdoors and in, in, in the forests. At Chopwell Woods, we had an active forest coordinator who was much more involved in managing actual caseload, so doing a bit of coordination, but also doing a bit of, of delivery, working alongside third party uh, activity leaders. At uh, Westenburg, very different setup where everything is the caseload and the referrals are taken by the team and they directly deliver their sessions. And then Something else that we've, we, we've done traditionally across uh, Forestry England is through what we call our permission system, but where individual businesses, be they Nordic walkers, yoga instructors, running coaches, actually run a business using the forest estate and we work with them in a more commercial way. So our target audience were people who are physically inactive, people who are not regularly using the forest, and people that were wanting to improve their overall mental and physical well-being. And one of the things that I think, again, we all intuitively know, but uh, historically used to be a, seen as a byproduct, but actually people that were wanting to reduce social isolation and increase their social connection, sometimes the activity is just the hook and the, the real benefits from, come from being with people doing a similar activity or having similar experiences and being able to chat with those folks. So the outcomes that we were looking at for the participants were to be more active, uh, that's more physically active, more connected to nature and to the forest. And that, that connection was going on beyond just being in the forest, but actually getting down into uh, the Derby University's uh, connectedness to nature and really having that emotional experience, having that sensory experience in, in, in the forest, uh, more connected to each other. So again, that's that social isolation or uh, people to, uh, from uh, with like-minded outlooks doing similar things, um, more empowered uh, by uh, maybe riding a bike for the first time or re-riding a bike that I hadn't ridden for 40 years, a sense of achievement, a, a sense of I can do something to take that back into their lives again, to say, well, maybe I can take on these other uh, challenges or things that have been a barrier for me before. And really importantly for the social prescribing program was being more included and actually shaping and contributing to the program itself so very very clear on not doing unto people but those people being part of the process part of the experience and shaping and reshaping programs and, and projects as they evolved and developed on site 
So just a, a few numbers. Uh, so over 6,000 visits to Chopwell and Thames Chase during the pilot. Uh, 353 individuals uh, were in, involved in the programme. Uh, a lot of texts are in the middle, but basically the, the, the ONS and WEMWEB scores were showing that the target audience we wanted to work with was the target audience that were coming along. So at the start of programmes, they were uh, expressing lower self-esteem and happiness with the world. Um, we've had the, the pilots independently uh, evaluated by Forest Research and all the participants were saying the goals that they'd set themselves were being met. So there's more social interaction, reduced social, uh, social isolate, isolation, people were enjoying nature, being part of nature, uh, very much contributed to mental well-being and definitely people were more physically active. Uh, in terms of aligning the, the social prescribing services, we, we've tried to get an approach where at the bottom of our, what we call our um, forest wellbeing pyramid, the bottom of the pyramid are the, the, the walking trails, cycling trails, routes uh, that people can just turn up and use for themselves. So that everyday use without much intervention beyond the physical management of infrastructure. Uh, the second bit in the middle is joining others. So that might be a group, it might be a park run, it might be volunteers. And Feel Good in the Forest very much sits in the green care element at the top of the pyramid, where we give people the confidence and skills to then move down the pyramid to, to get involved with, with other activities or to do things independently. Um, for Forestry England, this is not, not a step into the unknown, but what we want to do as a legacy is give local teams, and district teams, the skills and knowledge to continue to engage with the health sector and with public health. So we've got a little seven step uh, toolkit that we're sharing with our teams so that they can gain knowledge and understanding. And part of my role over the next two years is just to work with those teams to see what's going on locally. Um, so that there is a bridge between what, what they know is, as managers and crunchside managers, site managers, and their local communities and local community needs. Uh, just a few things that are, uh, are from learning. We know that referrals come from everywhere and, and, and uh, it's not necessarily constrained to link workers. So it's just being aware of what organisation are out there. We did find that mental health support needs of participants can be quite high. And it's just being aware that people, uh, the, the staff teams that are delivering activities or uh, managing sites may not have the initial training or support that they need to uh, deal with uh, people with, with uh, mental health challenges. Direct, direct caseload, really hard work, and that, that can be very resource intensive. And a lot of our first contact for our Australian staff may not have the skills or knowledge to deal with situations that they come across in the first instance. So training the staff team is really important. Um, in terms of delivery, relationships take time. And I think we all understand that to build a successful project, you need to take the time to go out to reach out to communities, find out what they're interested in, what floats your boat, what makes you want to, to, to be involved. Being really clear about who's responsible for what, um, having systems in place so that, that can be monitored safely. And we're really keen on what happens next. So at the end of an eight to 12 week programme of uh, introduction to Nordic walking, there's something to go on to, not just to be left hanging. Uh, monitoring and evaluation. Gathering survey information can be a challenge for people that are very heavily surveyed quite often. And some of the questions that we do ask can actually, I've had a lovely day, and now you're asking me how I felt yesterday when I felt rubbish. And we can we need to be careful not taking people back into that cycle. Longitudinal uh, monitoring is, is challenging. How do we, over months, years, find out whether that intervention was the thing that really worked? It can be done, but that can be resource intensive. Um, a lot of uh, the uh, evaluation that we did was not using traditional digital means or surveys, but was smiles per miles and using magnetic boards just to get that feeling for how people uh, were, were getting involved with the programme. Um, and finally, the qualitative data and the case studies are really important. I think we've seen just this afternoon those quotes and stories. The numbers are important, but we could see 100,000 people and say, so what? We see 100 people and we get those stories saying, this changed my life. This gave me direction. This gave me purpose. Really, really powerful. So we need to get that balance between the two. Um, and some of the barriers are what we would expect. So transport, although transport is a default situation, sometimes we, check, we can challenge communities and they will find innovative ways of how they can share transport, community transport schemes. So it needn't necessarily be, be a barrier. 
Um, some of our sites are quite expensive and that's our destination sites. But by going to where communities are in some of our community woodlands that are on the, the borders of urban centres, there will be free to use spaces. So it doesn't necessarily have to be travel to a destination site. For older and vulnerable people, having toilets and shelter for those days when it's not always going to be perfect weather, really important. Really important. Um, we're finding the green social prescribing is coming up the agenda bit by bit, but there's still quite a lot of work to be done to get that accepted in the social prescribing world. And often funding is quite short term. So how do we overcome those, um, those uh, humps in the road to get that, that legacy in place? So that's a bit of a whistle stop. I'm really happy to chat to anyone at length. And it's something that I can. I can bore for England on this. Um, but I'll put, put my email address in the chat. So if anybody wants to pick up a bit further, please do give me a shout. And uh, we've got lots of other learning as well that may be of use. Uh, so thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, I bet you didn't even notice that I dropped out there for a while, did you? Um, we've had a power cut here, so um, I'm hot spotted from my phone now. Um, always happens, doesn't it, when you don't want it? Um, it means I've lost some of the questions. So, panel, I might be referring back to you guys to um, answer some of the questions that you can see, because I can only see the new questions um, on that. So thank you very much, Tim. So moving on to our last um, speaker this afternoon, and he's kind of homegrown one of our own because he is one of the people that we've been talking about kind of all day, one of the nature recovery rangers um, working for the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. So um, we're going to hear from Nick, who um, is, is a countryside manager at heart. He's, a, he's an environmentalist, he's a doer, he likes to get his hands dirty, but it's obviously now working and with people and using those people to, to kind of help manage the sites um, that are close to the areas that we want to get to, but also kind of valuing the, the, the skills that he can pass on to the kind of next generation. So um, Nick, over to you to talk us through, and you have the last slot, so you lucky person. but you will need to come off mute. I will indeed. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, Christina is going to be putting my presentation on the screen. Uh, or, Mo. or possibly me. Okay. Thank you. So uh, as Helen says, my name's uh, Nick. And I work for the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare as a nature recovery ranger, and I'm based at Liverpool. So I sit in with the Liverpool University's hospital sustainability team. And my role principally is to help increase the biodiversity across the three main sites that the Trust has, and also to involve staff, patients and the local community in connecting with nature. Uh, next slide, please. So the site I'm talking about today is called Bluebell Woods. It's a mixed 14 hectare woodland dating back over 200 years. Predominant county species are Oak Beach with about two hectares of alder and willow carp. It's of significant wildlife value, but it's no formal designation. And it adjoins Aintree Hospital and is part of a larger network of green spaces that follow the course of the Zachary Brook. So in this morning's presentation, uh, where a reference was made to the uh, the site in Fazakli, where they'd be measuring carbon, et cetera, this, this, is, this is that site. It's locally known as Bluebell Woods. It's jointly owned by Liverpool City Council and the Trust. Um, and due to budgetary pressure, both organisations are only undertake essential work, which means that footpaths are kept clear and dangerous trees are, are felled or removed. Uh, other than that, there is no revenue budget for carrying out other work on the site. Uh, as a result of which, uh, we have problems with invasive species such as sycamore and rhododendron impacting the biodiversity of the woodland. And historically, 
with uh, as with many urban woodlands it suffered from high levels of antisocial behavior and misuse it's in a very urban environment it's one of the few natural green spaces available to to local people and as a result of which it's very very highly valued by the local community uh, next slide please In the early 2000s, Lancashire Wildlife Trust were commissioned to engage with the local community and they established uh, a Friends of Bluebell Wood. A theme is going to come up of short term funding as I, as I speak, uh, and, and I'll talk through how, how we're trying to address that and stabilise that going forward. Um, the Wildlife Trust project was funded up until 2014. Since that time, the hospital has supported the Friends Group, providing storage space for tools and equipment and assisting with grant applications. Uh, our local community forest, which is the Mersey Forest, produced uh, a 25 year woodland management plan for the site to sort of help guide the, um, the, the, the trust and the city council in, in how it managed the site going forward. Um, and at the same time, the trust started working with CSH and in 2021 appointed its first nature recovery ranger. The ranger worked with their friends and involved other groups in the care of the woods. But funding for that post uh, ended in March 2022. Next slide, please. So in the summer of 22, new funding was secured through the Liverpool City region, uh, and I was appointed as the new Nature Recovery Ranger in the September of that year. So I've been working at Liverpool now for just about, just over 12, 12 months. And I work across the whole of the hospital estate with one day a week dedicated to Bluebell Woods. So one of the first things that I did when, when I uh, came into post was to meet with the friends of Blue Bellwood uh, and with them produced a work programme based on delivering the short term objectives of the, the Mersey Forest Management Plan. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the, the, the woodland management objectives, this was essentially looking at how we could increase the biodiversity and reduce the problems associated with the antisocial behaviour and misuse of the site. Uh, so the photograph shows a large area of Himalayan balsam, which was endemic across the site. And the slide at the, the photograph at the bottom uh, is fly tipping uh, into the brook. That's actually drug paraphernalia from a cannabis farm. So we, we have some very high levels of misuse of the site. Um, but thankfully, uh, things have started to improve. So uh, next slide, please. So this is what we've achieved over the last 12 months in terms of the um, the work that's been undertaken largely through 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 volunteers. Um, we've improved habitats. Um, the removal of self-generated sycamore uh, and rhododendron has uh, revealed lots of small, more desirable tree species. So, so we, we've seen that natural regeneration uh, on, on the woodland floor. Fly tipping is now swiftly dealt with and the site's kept free of litter. As a consequence, we have more visitors, less antisocial behaviour, and there's a genuine community pride um, in the work that, that's, that, that's been undertaken. And the, the site, as it is, being used much more frequently and by more people. Uh, an example of uh, habitat improvement, the, the photographs at the bottom um, were taken in days of each other. Um, so the, it's a pond um, and the drainage channel had completely silted up. So the volunteers and myself cleared that channel and that pond has now held water 
uh, throughout the summer. And for the first time in over five years, uh, frogs were able to successfully breed in the pond. And we had lots of little froglets uh, emerge from there uh, over the summer period. Uh, next slide, please. All of the work that we're doing um, is being delivered in partnership with the local community. So we work with the with the local friends group um, and also with local businesses uh, and organize corporate volunteer days and work work with staff from the hospital as well. Importantly, uh, establishing a good relationship with the local authority, good working relationship with the lo local authority uh, was identified as a priority and environmental organizations um, and those that support marginalized people. Um, we're also looking at providing activities which connect people with the natural environment and a non-clinical space which can be used for mental and physical therapies. Next slide, please. So what have we achieved? Um, over the year, I've worked with a wide range of organizations and established new partnerships with statutory and third sector bodies. Um, just looking at uh, the photographs there, um, photographs also from top left to right, um, that's Liverpool Fire and Rescue Service on a Himalayan balsam bashing day. Um, next to that is the Hospital Trust Sustainability Team um, planting trees during National Tree Week. The picture at the bottom left is Liverpool Beekeeping Society. So we reached out to Liverpool Beekeeping Society and they now have a hive uh, on the hospital site. And the woodland is, is a great source of pollen for, for the honeybees. As part of the fact that we were having honeybees coming onto the site, potentially competing with native bees, we worked with the estates team to change the management regime of the grassland areas within the main hospital site. And uh, we've converted uh, a hectare of previous immunity grass into wildflower meadow, which has been very successful. Uh, the picture shows the, the um, beekeepers talking to um, a group of hospital staff. It's one of a number of beekeeping demonstrations that, uh, that they have provided. A uh, photograph of the people in front of the white van are the conservation volunteers, uh, and that's their midweek group, um, and they run uh, a green social prescribing scheme and um, they, they have helped on the site. And the final picture is myself with some of the friends of Blue Bell Wood, who really are the stalwarts of, uh, of caring for the woodland. They, they have a dedicated group of volunteers. There's about eight people in total. That's uh, some, of the, some of the group there. And the picture is of, of them being presented the uh, partnership award uh, from the sustainability team. So it, this year, the Friends of Bluebell would won the sustainability award for partnerships. Uh, next slide, please. So the future. Um, funding has been secured for my post and the work that I do within Bluebell Woods up to June 2024. And that's through an arrangement with DSM. DSM are uh, a major contractor to the trust. They're demolishing the old Liverpool Royal Hospital. And as part of their social values commitment, which was included in the tender, um, they have um, agreed to, to fund the work that I do. Um, Una is going to share in the chat um, the information uh, about the social values portal, which includes all the details of how this scheme, scheme operates. Over the next 12 months, there's going to be greater involvement of the conservation volunteers in caring for the site and more corporate volunteer days for both staff 
and local businesses. Uh, it was mentioned this morning about the NHS Greener Communities Fund. Um, earlier this year, we submitted a bid to the NHS Greener Communities Fund for the 24-26 for the period. And if successful, this will fund the range of post and works to Blue Bell Woods, which would see the footpaths being upgraded, provide on-site interpretation and regular resting points, making it uh, an easier and safer site for everyone to be able to, to enjoy. Alongside that, uh, CSH and the Trust are also investigating other funding opportunities to uh, secure long-term funding for the site. Bluebell Woods has been classified by Liverpool City Council as a valuable, valuable habitat for nature con 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 conservation, uh, and it will form part of the Local Planning Authority's Habitat Bank, which will be available for the developers who are unable to achieve the, the new requirements under local planning legislation uh, for 10% biodiversity net gain on their own sites. So the new net gain um, legislation will be a mechanism for ecologically important sites like Bluebell Woods to be managed in the long term for the benefit of wildlife and the health and well-being of local communities. Um, so potentially we have got funding for 30 years, uh, which will enable the full management plan that the Mersey Forest produced to be delivered. Uh, next slide, please. So thank you very much for listening. There's my contact details. I'm quite happy to pick up uh, conversations with people uh, either through the Q&A or if you want to contact me directly and find out more about the project, uh, I'll put my email details in the chat. So thank you very much. Thanks, Nick. Um, I'm guessing I'm handing back to Una while everybody, all the panelists join me. So we can, um, we've got a very short 10 minutes to go through some questions and answers. Um, so do we have all the panelists? Here we go. Well, that's interesting. As soon as you spotlight them, I, I lose where I am. So Ben, Ben, may, may I just take this opportunity, first of all, before we go through the questions in the Q&A. Ben, you spoke about developing green walking groups for psychiatric inpatients. But what are your thoughts about people that are able to access the green walking programmes um, once they've been discharged from the ward? Okay. That question, that was something I didn't touch on in the presentation. It would be great if... Um, people going onto the wards, if they discover the joys of green walking, that when they're discharged from the ward, they would be able to access that in the community. And it would also be great if there are people who um, do use green walking as a way of maintaining their mental well-being when they go onto the wards, that can continue. So really what we would like to work towards is a paradigm shift where green walking is seen as an integral part of mental health services from primary care through to acute um, inpatient settings. And we know, like you mentioned in lockdown, a lot of people discovering this as a way of um, supporting their well-being. And a lot of GPs are now socially describing green walking. So this is happening in primary care. And um, part of the reason we started with inpatient settings is because those people will benefit the most from green walking are those who experience it the least. And that includes a lot of um, psychiatric patients. But ultimately, we would like to work towards this being across all settings. Well, follow-up question from Karen is that she'd like to know whether there's a process or a protocol available for integrating into care pathways. But that's a good question. If um, have a look at the Green Walking Guide, which um, I can put another link to in the chat if that's necessary. Um, but in, there is information on our um, website which has um, suggestions for services, hospitals, and suggestions for um, 
NHS trusts, health boards, ICSs, and um, ways that maybe we at CSH could work with different groups to get this integrated um, more widely. And there's another question for me from Katie, is that um, how have you, how have the trusts and the um, patient and staff got over the safety aspects of allowing mental health, vulnerable mental health patients um, off-site for walking? So when people are on the ward, um, they do have leave and they can have escorted leave or unescorted leave. And that building up is part of the safety planning and discharge planning. So this is a way of using um, that leave in a different manner. Very often people who have this leave might just walk to the shops, buy something, walk back. And um, often during groups, when there are walking groups, there is that kind of social aspect to it. The beauty of the green walking group is it takes out any of the social describing and it's um, any of the social aspects and it just focuses on the engagement with nature. And so the social groups happen separately to that. But as Julie said, um, they did look at positive risk taking um, in terms of the, the groups they did. And as I mentioned, Julie will be part of our networking group. So yeah, if you'd like to come and ask Julie how they navigated that, you should be able to answer that. And then just last quick question, is there any um evidence or examples of working specifically with children and young people on green walking? No, we we have been in liaison um, with time service and that we can't get, but we haven't um, worked on this with them yet. Okay, um, there, there are, yeah, so there are case studies, each of the Green Beacon sites and other places have case studies um, on our green walking pages. So people may be able to find more details there as well. So thank you. Carol, thank you. There's, there's, a, there's a question um, from Jax. How do you find these companies that kind of contribute to the small projects like creating the raised beds and providing the soil? You know, is it a question of just knocking on doors, phoning a friend? How do you do it? Um, yeah, we're shameless on um, social media. Um, so we just ask if there's something we need. And usually if you post something somewhere, somebody will respond. Um, and yeah, just making um, contacts with um, old colleagues. Um, yeah. I like the first answer, be shameless. I like that. Like stick, that. stick with that one, just be shameless. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you don't ask, you don't get, do you? There's a question from Sarah here as well about how do you ensure the health and safety requirements when you use on-site grown food in, th in terms of kind of cafes and canteens? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, we had a period of time where we weren't uh, able uh, to supply the uh, cafe um, uh, because everything was bought in. Um, there's a number of things. We grow things in raised beds. So um, for uh, planning um, purposes, we were not allowed to grow directly into the ground um, in case it was contaminated. Um, but then um, one of the people that uh, champions um, the, the gardens um, is um, she heads up sustainability um, and I don't know, she must, she must have found a way around it. <laughs> so I don't know the ins and outs. Well, if we if we learn more about that, I think we that's a good one to share, actually, because it's yeah. been interesting some of the chat earlier on today about the kind of the negative aspects of connection with nature, you mm. know, in terms of, you know, we've, we've heard all the great stuff about putting your hands in soil, and then we hear the other side of it from the clinicians that are scared stiff of, uh, you know, dirt. And bacteria so it's it's a real it's an interesting dilemma the health sector has isn't it yeah the the compost heap that was controversial really? <laughs> and the bees the bees didn't make it we did want bees but health and safety wouldn't allow the bees <laughs> well it was it was the same as the ponds that were coming up earlier actually so so, so it is an interesting one i'm just conscious of time here um th there was a question maybe if this one's for tim i don't know really but is there any resources or research that looks at barriers to access from car and public transport reliance sites. Um, you know, 
How do you get around that? I, I, I don't, I'm not personally aware of any research, but I'm, I'm sure there will be research out there. But I, the, I think the challenge is that um, maybe we need to think more about not getting people to where the sites are that we're doing, but actually taking the activities to where there are sites closer to people. And for Forestry England, that might mean that it's not our site, but it's a wildlife trust site or a, a, a local NHS site. So we start building those relationships and confidence saying, well, actually, yes, the bus is a bit further away, but maybe you could you know, use public transport to get so far. So it, it, it's about looking at things a bit more innovatively rather than just, just necessarily saying transport's a problem. It's a challenge rather than the problem, if, if I can be semantic. But we can, I'm sure, working together, we can find ways around that. It's an interesting one, isn't it? It's an interesting one. The government's going to get to grips with the 15 minutes um, target as well of giving ac people access to the countryside. So um, no doubt we'll come back to that one. Um, there's a question. Uh, where was it? I was quite interested in this one. Um, how do we better use qualitative research than the quantitative measuring of kind of health um, benefits? You know. We talked about that kind of those those quotes and how powerful they are, but but are they really persuasive? Who's got who's got experience of how persuasive that kind of evidence can be? Gordon, you must have some experience on this. Yeah, I mean, at Dementia Adventure, we're always doing a, a range of situations, but our most powerful are the stories that people tell us. And so we're always producing case studies that obviously are great um, emotional draws, really, because people want to see the personal impact. <clears throat> and we have a range. So whenever we're delivering training or delivering a service, we do evaluate. So we create a, a, a quantitative evaluation tool. But we also ask all participants through the survey if they would be happy to be part of a case study that we would actually work with them. We would produce a Dementia Adventure, but then provide them so they can actually celebrate it on their media channels as well for their own organisation. So for us, that that is the most powerful tool that we have. And also from all the, the things that we do, collecting quotes um, is really key. Um, as we've heard today, so they, those things are the most emotive and they really, really, you know, give us a demonstration of the true impact of a project. Yeah, I also think that the videos are very powerful as well. So that it's again, it's about storytelling, isn't it? Yeah. Um, when none of us really are from the clinical sector to say how well that type of evidence is received, really. So maybe that's one for others to kind of answer is 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 that go on Tim you've got you you, you wave your finger at me it, it's, it's not, not. Um, I, I think the chance is getting in front of the right people um and often the, the the right people are so time poor that that's the difficulty but if we could get even better get the right people on site talking to the people with the stories that I think that has much more impact than you know, the videos have impact, the case studies have impact, but it's actually meeting face to face with the people that are benefiting from those services is would be the ideal. But that, I'm an idealist, and you know, we we can but dream. Well, you've been so you've been successful today, as have all of you, in some shape or form, to get the kind of funding for your work. So I congratulate you on that. Um, Helen, I think... Helen, I was just going to add about the the, the, the case study materials and the videoing. Obviously, um, Dementia Adventure did a big project during lockdown where we couldn't meet people, but just using Zoom. So that video of Chris and Jane, that was undertaken over Zoom. Um, we managed through communicating with our colleagues that you know live with dementia and their carers, we produced 95 short films about the impact of uh, the projects that they participate in, but also the life that they were living and the challenges they were facing, but what really helped. And so it doesn't have to cost a fortune. You don't have to get expensive video makers because, as I say, I think that that video for us is incredibly powerful. We use it so many times. Um, and again, Zoom is a great tool to just collect those stories, but more impactfully through video. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious of time and that I've got to hand back to Sarah. So thank you very much, everybody, for participating in the panel discussions for your very inspirational um, presentations this afternoon. You are all amazing people doing amazing work. Thank you. And before I do hand back to Sarah, I just want to say from a personal perspective, having been lost power and been kicked out, thank you very much to Una and Massimo for um, getting me back online and getting the questions to me. Um, your, your, your help to us all has been very much appreciated today.
great. Well, thank you so much, Helen, and thank you to all of those speakers uh, for such interesting talks and so inspiring as well to hear about how people across the country are engaging people and communities in green spaces. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing about all of those. So we have come to the end of our kind of formal talks and presentations for the conference. Um, so I hope you've all really enjoyed listening to all of those. Um, we're not quite finished. We have our very exciting awards, um, our NHS Forest Awards, uh, which I'm going to talk through uh, with you all. Before I go into that, we're going to share, um, we've obviously just been talking <laughs> at the end of that discussion there about evaluation. Um, and I think Una is going to share a link to um, our evaluation form for the conference, um, which will also go out by email. Um, but if you'd like to use the time now to fill that out, sometimes it's helpful to just do it rather than adding it to your to-do list. So um, please do uh, uh, click on that link and give us some feedback on the conference today. We'd really love to hear from you um, about what went well, what we could improve on the next time. Um, so yes, please do go ahead and do that. Um, as you're doing that, um, I will kick us off talking uh, through our exciting awards. Um, so my phone is going to share the screen again. So these um, are projects uh, from NHS sites who have submitted, um, who have either been nominated or nominated themselves for awards. Um, so I. First, I want to say thank you to Duncan Mackay, who is uh, one of CSH's trustees and formerly the head of urban and peri-urban environment for Natural England, um, who helped select the winners uh, for these awards. Um, we really enjoyed reading through them all and, and listening to all the, uh, the really amazing work that's been going on. So the first award uh, is for Innovative Development of Green Space at Health Sites. And the winner is the Lambeth Community Care Centre at Guys and St Thomas NHS Foundation. Um, and they have constructed a therapy garden, um, which they've called a limb care garden, to help support patients to learn wheelchair and prosthetic skills, uh, which is fantastic. And the runner up is the Christie NHS Foundation Trust uh, for their multitude of biodiversity improvements. Um, they, they've done loads. <laughs> and especially their living walls. And you can see a picture of that uh, just there on, on the right. Uh, the next award um, is for the active community engagement. Um, and the winner for this award is the Park Road Houses at Cardiff and Bill University Health Board uh, for a collaborative effort between staff, patients, and volunteers from the community to transform a barren space into a vibrant and accessible garden. Um, I loved this quote that they put into their application saying, we witnessed a profound change in our community dynamics. The sense of pride, accomplishment, and joy among participants is measurable. And um, so really inspiring work there, well done. The runner up for this award is the Cripps Health Centre at the University of Nottingham Health Service uh, for donating food from their allotment group um, to a mission called Guru Nana in Nottingham, uh, which exists feed the hungry in Nottingham. So well done to you both. Um, the next award is for pioneering use of green space by healthcare professionals. And the winner for this award is Littlemore Mental Health Centre at Oxford Health NHS Foundation Trust. Um, and that is for their Tiny Forest Science Days. We've heard a few uh, mentions of tiny forests throughout the day today. Um, so they've got a tiny forest nearby and they have science days where they take staff and patients um, to their local tiny forest as part of patient therapy and connecting with nature. Um, so well done, little more. And the runner up is the University Hospital Clando at the Cardiff and Vale University Health Board um, for working with Down to Earth um, to co-design and deliver green infrastructure to facilitate rehabilitation and recovery programmes. And last but not least, our final award of the day is for successful ways to support biodiversity. And the winner for this award is the Christie NHS Foundation Trust for their multitude of biodiversity improvements, such as birdhouses, bat boxes, ponds, living walls, native plantings, reuse of materials and permeable concrete. 
uh, just to name a few. Uh, so well done to the Christie NHS uh, Foundation Trust. And the runner up is the Princess Anne Hospital uh, in Southampton. And that's for their roof garden project with 84 plants and seven tree species, a wildlife, uh, wildflower meadow to support bumblebees, butterflies and other pollinators. So well done to all of those amazing projects. Um, we just have a final few notable projects, um, which I think was on the next slide, <laughs> which has just disappeared. Um, first of all, for Darwin Nurseries and Farm Shop, which is in Cambridge and Peterborough, uh, for reinstating their permaculture beds at their farm shop. Um, uh, South Mead Hospital, uh, for developing natural spaces inside and around the hospital for patient health and well-being and Stratford upon Avon Hospital for their garden of well-being, uh, which are all listed there. Um, and I think on the previous slide, there was the winner for um, the most trees planted. And there was joint winners for this at Guild Lodge and uh, Baldock Surgery, and they both planted a thousand trees. That's amazing. So yes, huge well done to all the winners. Um, and thanks everyone for your congratulations in the chat as well. So I'm just going to finish this up um, with a few uh, closing comments. Um, as I say, please do fill out the uh, feedback form uh, if you haven't done that already. Um, so in our keynote speech uh, earlier this morning, Alexis Percival reminded us of the crisis that we're facing with biodiversity and nature and the role that the NHS and healthcare sites have to play in tackling this crisis. In our first session this morning, we heard about how trees and woodlands on the NHS estate are a valuable healthcare asset. They support health and well-being. they reduce air pollution and excess urban heating, they offer financial benefits to NHS trusts um, beyond what we could even cover today. We then heard about planning for planting trees and woodlands on the NHS estate including the importance of maintaining trees over the decades to come. Uh, we heard about biodiversity net gain requirements and stories of woodland creation plans in action. And this afternoon uh, in the session we've just had, we heard inspiring stories of how people are being engaged with nature through increasing accessibility to green spaces, using them for therapeutic and wellbeing benefits and creating a sense of community through green space activities. Green spaces, trees and woodlands have vast benefits that can be seen from the broad range of talks that we've heard today, from improving air quality to well-being benefits, to addressing health inequalities, to reducing other environmental hazards, um, such as urban heating, uh, to building community and to providing therapeutic benefits, um, just to name a few. <laughs> and, you know, there's even more that we've discussed today. Um, and even more than that as well. The value of our trees and woodlands goes beyond what we can even cover uh, in a conference like today. And I hope that everyone who's attended feels really inspired by all of the talks that we've heard today. Um, and I hope that you all feel more equipped uh, with the tools and knowledge uh, to take advantage of green spaces at your NHS site. As a reminder, the NHS Forest has free trees available for NHS sites in England, and we're able to provide advice and support in planning, planting and maintenance of those trees. Um, so please do make sure you order your trees. Um, we've shared the link a few times throughout today, um, and we can definitely share that again. So all that's left to say from me is thank you so much to all of our fantastic speakers and chairs. Um, and to the wonderful behind the scenes team who have done a fantastic job of keeping us so on track that I think we're actually gonna finish 10 minutes early. <laughs> um, and of course, thank you so much to all of you, all of our attendees uh, for coming to our conference today. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your week and let's make sure that others within the NHS understand the true value of our trees and woodlands on the NHS estate. Thank you so much for coming today. <laughs>